welcome everybody. This is our fifth-ish year at Cornell and our 31st year for this program, which we just um, kicks off the beginning of every year and we think is incredibly important and meaningful. We really strive to make this program a kind of snapshot of many of the things the league does that Jacob's going to be talking about soon. So we'll, the three practitioners who will be speaking, whose biographies you have here, so we will not give them lengthy and boring introductions, but you can look at it here, um, all are practicing very differently from each other. And the firms that you were given an option to visit are each very different. And we always choose an end of the day firm that is both big enough to accommodate everybody, but that really has a practice that represents different aspects of architecture. I hesitate to use the word interdisciplinary, but they like it. So maybe we could use that. Um, you've got the agenda here and I am not Zoe, as you can see. And I want to ask you all a favor. Zoe Fruitner is the league's program manager. She just started working in the summer and hit the ground running. Then is the hand behind the massive organization that this program made. She's ended up having to organize a Zoom feed at home because she's getting over from COVID. Could you please give her a round of applause? She's She's, she's done an incredible job and we have an online audience equal to the size of the um, crowd here. So we're really happy about that and that sort of mix of architecture schools that that means. So the panelists are all gonna join us and they're gonna go through in the order that we have on um, your agenda. Thank you for braving the weather and for joining us today. Hi everyone, um, I'm Violet Delisel and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the work uh, that I do, which involves building, but also not building. Uh, and this is something that I'll try to give you as a uh, look back at how I've put together my life in architecture and um, any interesting takeaways that that may yield. Um, so I have always been interested in architecture and building things, but that from an early age was a very daunting and ambitious seeming uh, prospect. So how do you build, really build a big and permanent and sort of immutable structures? Um, it turns out that there's a long history among architects of working in groups of uh, sort of a, um, a food chain where you hone your skills and develop them over time. And I've been lucky to work with different practices um, over different stretches of time to really see projects come to life. And I really value all those experiences in different teams. Um, and I saw, um, I'll, I'll get into the buildings themselves, but um, what I, one thing I thought was really interesting is that all of the architects have their passions in the profession and they're driven by different interests. So it, it's not, that everybody loves stairs or one person only wants to design schools, but you might come across someone who really wants to design schools and you might find someone who's passionate about landscape and you might work with someone who knows everything about stairs and it's actually fascinating and a very rich experience. Um, <clears throat> this is a school that I worked on. It's a public school in Hunters Point South at FX File Architects. Um, we started in 2009 with a chipboard model and then 2014, it was actually realized. That was exciting to see the project really all the way uh, come to life. I can't say that I saw it all the way through because five years after the chipboard model, I was in graduate school. Um, but it is an interesting um, and fulfilling arc to really see buildings come together. Um, another project that I worked on on the next slide uh, is when I was at Shop Architects, uh, this is after graduate school, was a much smaller project for um, an intermediate and uh, an intermediate and middle school in Media, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia. And this was a fabrication lab for students. Um, this is a school that specializes for students with learning disabilities who are very talented at making things. So this was the space where they would be experimenting with robotics. Um, and different making techniques. And so one of the main features of the space was designing the, ce the ceiling. That took two years. It, it's, it's a lot of work to make architecture. Um, and I wanna stress that because I think that in, in the making of architecture, there is a determination and a concentration of effort that 
is really wonderful, but also to me started to feel like I was losing perspective and a balance that I find healthy and rewarding. Um, so I also want to talk about not building. Um, so this is uh, Perspecta. Perspecta is a journal that the School of Architecture at Yale puts out. Um, I went to Yale for graduate school and I was one of the editors of the 49th issue. Um, and that's an endeavor that took also three years, so longer than the ceiling. Um, but we, it bridged the time that we were in school as students and the time that we were in practice. And what could have been a really overwhelming task to work on this theoretical and sort of text-based journal while being in an office, modeling, drawing, refining projects was actually a very fulfilling one where I felt like all of the work that would take up the day in the office could be supplemented by really thinking about what is architecture doing? What does architecture contribute to a, on a, in a wider field? Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of articles in this issue of perspective that I wanna point out to you because they're important to me in how, um, how architecture as a community really builds. So the, the next, so the, the subject of our perspective was quote, and it was the idea that ideas travel through generations of architecture. Um, all of these architects and practitioners, whether licensed or unlicensed or researchers are always sort of grappling with familiar themes. Um, and I think this is um, the graphic design by the two graphic designers, Martha McGill, and Minhee Lee, who collaborated with us on this. And I didn't cite my collaborators, but AJ Ardemel and Russell Lesturgeon and I were the editors. Um, I think that the graphic designer's layout really explains just how repetitive, how familiar these architectural obsessions are. This is about the Parthenon, which of course is um, referenced all around the world. Um, and in the next essay, on the next page, um, this is a, a text by Elias and Gellis, who was my professor, um, who really describes the architectural practice as an as a practice of interpretation and not one of invention. Um, so these, this body of thought really helped me see architecture not just as a practice of building things, which is where I really started. An architect builds, and I wanted to be involved in that, and I still do. But also, like architecture is bigger than just the construction of projects. It's this lineage and this exchange among all the people interested in architecture and its ideas. So um, I also want to tell you about City Group, uh, which is another practice of not building. Um, so we're a collective of artists and architects based in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And we meet to really uh, explore that distance between the group of architectural thinkers and the practice of artists, it's uh, of architecture itself. So we were interested in how, after working a few years in different practices, while we were involved in the buildings that get erected through the city, what does that do to the city? What is who is the city inhabited by? Who ends up living in the buildings we're constructing, and so on and so forth. So, um, city group is a space where we could really debate those trends um, and we can talk about larger issues, we can have exhibitions, we can mount small projects. We've really tried, and I think the next slide, uh, oh yes, City Group is a group effort. Again, like I really wanna emphasize that we don't work in isolation. It's very much all of us together um, trying to maybe get rid of this idea of originality in architecture and geniuses, it's, everybody's a genius. Um, in the next slide, this is to describe that we tried to work among communities that are familiar to us. So in this case, this is the neighborhood of Chinatown in the Lower East Side where Citigroup is based. So we are trying not to embody the role of the architect who arrives and um, describes to a community what is to come, but rather listens to the community, understands what efforts are already underway and then uses our architectural tools uh, toolkit uh, maybe to assist those efforts. So there is 
a community-led rezoning plan in it's being floated that has not been vetted by the city, but these grassroots, grassroots activist organizations are trying to promote it. So we as architects um, produce renderings and are trying to explain to people what zoning is, how zoning affects them. So this was a zoning teaching activity. And then on the next slide, um, you see the poster. This is like the construction poster that you have on the construction fence, except that ours has a, um, a different rendering that would promote the ideas of the rezoning plan. In the next slide, um, I can show you that these, the idea is sort of how to disseminate the information. So we also made pamphlets with these illustrations. Um, and then I don't wanna go too long, so I'll speed up a bit. This is, the next project is one that we did for the Architecture League um, in a prompt to exhibit our work. Uh, so this is uh, a, a neighborhood gathering, a walking tour that wanted to draw attention to the fact that they're building these very high rise luxury, uh, super tall luxury towers on the Lower East Side waterfront, um, which has very significant impacts for the working class community who lives in Chinatown on the Lower East Side. This is the walking tour. We attended and we collected quotes from attendees. We also looked through the media, the coverage, and collected more quotes from different sources. Um, and those quotes ended up on uh, colorful posters on the next slide, uh, which we mounted on the construction fence for one of the towers whose piles were being drilled. So if you look further down, uh, we wanted to sort of uh, visualize that conversation and show that this is not a one and done deal. Um, while an architectural rendering might present this like, this is the project, there's actually a, a long and contested history to the project. And this is defense. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is, this is a, a, a project I worked at uh, on while I was at Shop Architects. This has a much longer history. Uh, this is the tin building in the South Street Seaport, also nearby, um, which was built in 1907. The, the photograph is from the 30s and has now been reconstructed in 20, been completed in 2022. Um, this is to suggest that once you get into the arc of preservation, uh, projects don't just start and stop the way I might have understood that at, at an earlier stage. There's a very long history to buildings and there are all these fascinating mechanisms through which they can be uh, reinterpreted, rebuilt, modified. Um, the next project is the project I was working on most, oh, these are uh, more of the documentation for the tin building. And then this is the building in New Haven I've been working on the most recently um, with a small developer architect based in Westport, Connecticut. Um, this is the Pirelli building in New Haven, Connecticut, or we know it as such because, well, it was originally built for the Armstrong Rubber Company. They manufactured tires. Pirelli, another tire company, bought them. It was known as the Pirelli Building. It was abandoned since the late 1990s. And then in 2020, in 2019, the Becker and Becker team acquired the site and set out to transform it into a net zero passive house lead platinum hotel. Um, so that's the project I've been working on. Um, most recently outside of Citigroup. And I think on the next slide, um, I, I, just to illustrate the, the long history of this site, what was once corporate offices in the hovering volume over a research and uh, production facility in the lower volume was half demolished by Ikea when they, they bought the site. Um, and now inhabits a scenario or footprint um, but this is now a hotel in which we dug a, if you can say dug, we carved a light well so that the interior of the floor plate could be used. Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects to preservation. Preservation isn't just reinserting yourself into the building. It, that's the very important aspect of it. I think it's a great way to think about the built environment as more and more opportunities, but you can also inject change and transformation. 
Um, and then at the next slide, just to show you that this project, which was almost a beacon of fossil fuel consumption, I mean, it was to sell tires to automobile drivers on I-95 because the neighbor to the site is I-95 is now, um, you know, solar powered. So it's a, it's a radical transformation. Um, I think in the next slide, I might have included the treatment of the facade. So these are Marcel Breuer's incredible drawings for how the facade panels all clip on to the steel structure. Uh, we had to look at the building from the inside and how to line it with insulation and different um, high-end, uh, high cutting-edge materials in order to not increase the width of the wall, but allow that to be a much better insulated, much better sealed envelope. Um, so this is invisible work. You won't see it inside the hotel because it's all inside the walls, but this is how you can make a building from the 70s um, adapt to today's wells. And then this is the last thing I'll talk about, but um, some of the research I'm doing right now is about the existing buildings on the Lower East Side. These are not considered historic. They are not landmarks, but they all change over time. Um, and it's very interesting to us to think about how, um, I think there's, there's a very last slide. Um, how these, oh, I think it was supposed to be a GIF, but it's not. So maybe the previous slide is more useful. Um, all of these buildings have much longer histories than we understand them at first glance. And that to me is a resource uh, and an interesting opportunity in the, in the built environment, something that I'd like to spend more time on in my um, years to come. Thank you. Hello, I'm Peter Robinson. Hello, I'm Peter Robinson. I am uh, the assistant professor um, of social justice and equity cohort in the Department of Architecture here at Cornell. And I was also our fall 2021 Mellon Scholar. I'm the principal of a um, practice called Work Urban, and I'm also a board member of the Black Space Urbanist Collective. I'm Along with that, I'm vice chair for the board of trustees at the Center for Architecture, and I'm secretary and treasurer for the board of directors at the American um, Collegiate Schools of Architecture. And so I want to share with you my spatial story. The spatial story um, is based on a course that I teach um, called Theories of Urban Form. And it's a way to interrogate cities or urbanism, but really through the perspective of our lives, how we lived and the people who sort of cared and loved and that we've shared space with. So I was born. So that's a picture of me going to school in the second grade. Um, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica. You can see the map of Kingston. Kingston is a city that is based in the Ligony Plains in the parish of St. Andrew. So it's a city that butts up to one of the deepest natural harbors in the world um, and goes to the back where the foothills of, of Kingston start. So I grew up in the center of that city in a place called Pembroke Hall, right off the boulevard. And some of the major features that you would encounter how I, in terms of the city that I lived in were two gullies or, or ways in which um, the British had devised a system to move water across the plains. And so a lot of my identity in the city was based around two sets of major infrastructure. I grew up two blocks from one of these sets of infrastructures and I had to cross another one in order to get to school. Um, next, please. And so I always, in this course, we always encourage our students to also interrogate the lives of their families and to think about where they come from. And so here you have a picture of my grandmother, Margarita Leslie, and her sister, um, Matasita, and also a picture of my great-grandfather, Fritz Robinson, who at his death owned one of the large, had built one of the largest um, cane um, farms in, in Jamaica. Next, please. At one point in their lives, my grandmother and her sister had migrated to Cuba. And so they were part of this um, interesting sort of, um, as the economy in Jamaica changed from agrarian um, and, and unionization started to take hold, especially in, in agriculture, a lot of Jamaicans were moving to Cuba to sort of build lives. And so they were a part of that migration where they'd moved, their mother had moved to Cuba for about two years um, when they were young. Next, please. Here you see a picture of my grandmother, Ivy Lomond, 
um, and my grandfather, author George Johnson. My grandmother was from the parish of um, Mandeville and my grandfather from the parish of St. Anne's in Jamaica. Next, please. Their marriage certificate, they were married in 1938 at the St. Andrew Parish Church that so they had met in Kingston in about 1936. In the two years they were, they were married. Uh, next, please. And St. Andrew Parish is one of the oldest parish churches in Jamaica. You see a picture of my great-grandmother, um, Miss Rubina Rickman, and this is one of sort of my fondest memories of her and my grandfather. When we were very young, we went to visit her um, at her home in St. Anne's, where my grandfather was born and raised. Um, she had fell in love with a white man who was a soldier who was on leave in Jamaica. When he returned to England, he died very quickly at the start of World War I, but her, his family kept in touch with my grandmother and sent her money to buy this land. Um, there was a bit of a land swindle. She couldn't read or write, so when um, the letter came, she trusted someone to interpret the letter, and that person bought themselves a large parcel of land and gave her the land in the middle. And so we always knew that growing up, and we still own this, we still have this land in our family, but that relationship to property has always sort of shaped um, how I thought about my life and what ended up being how I think about architecture. This was a structure that she would have built for us when we visited. And so this was right um, at the edge of her property, but it's part of a tradition of Jamaicans and also West African tradition of building a kind of a shelter to welcome people in. That's a picture of me and that's my grandfather and some of my cousins. All right, next please. And so to think, um, so here you have a picture of my grandparents at their 25th wedding anniversary. And that's, um, they had nine children. My mother is right to the left of my grandfather. Um, she would have been number eight of nine. Um, and there's a picture of me at one of our birthday parties. And that is a picture of my grandparents at their 50th anniversary. All of these events are happening around the same table. My grandfather was a carpenter by trade and he had built this table. Next, please. Right. And so now as I'm thinking more deeply about my family and how we lived and grew up, one of the first inklings of what is architecture as a gift started to happen around thinking about this table. And in pulling it apart and in talking with our family, I realized that my grandfather had not only made the table as a mahogany table, but he'd also made the tools that made the table. To think about the life of this table and how it sort of nourished and held and cared for my family was a huge part in how I began to think about what architecture could be and how architecture is relational, not separate and apart from the way we live our lives. Next, please. And so moving quickly ahead, I am a proud graduate of the High School of Art and Design. I graduated in 1993, and one of the most, I think, critical moments for me was being a part of the Training Opportunities Program. And what that did was it gave me the opportunity to work at a firm of architecture. I worked at Capella and Costo, now Costo Greenwood Architects um, in uh, Soho. And what I thought was really unique, in 1993, you had a public school in New York City that was turning out black architects. So at a time when today we're still questioning or trying to think of how do we increase diversity in the, in the profession, what was happening in New York City public school in the 1990s that allowed this to happen? It was working with community partners. It was working with in the infrastructure of the DOE to allow this to happen. I show a part a photo with a friend of mine, Andy Jordan, who is the licensed architect. Um, and this is a picture of both of us at um, uh, the last time NOMA did their conference in New York City. And just um, uniquely enough, this semester, as we're working with a community partner, our community partner, Ms. Ina McPherson in Brooklyn on Vernon Avenue, knew Andy Jordan when he was a little boy. And so what is it to recognize that as we talk about what it is to sort of be in work and stay relational to the places that we come from, that these aren't coincidences. These are um, actually kind of a way of practicing to always sort of reinsert yourself into what is local and what you know. You'll always sort of discover and find these unique traces. Next, please. And so I'm also a graduate of Cornell class of 1998. And at the time that I came to Cornell, there was this wonderful sort of space and community of black and brown architects um, that I was really lucky and privileged to be a part of. And it is, is a community of architects and planners and artists that really stayed together going on now for 25 years. Next, please. And so I'm showing you some snippets from my thesis. Um, as an undergrad, I was able to sort of go back to Jamaica and really begin to consider what I thought was one of the core infrastructures in the city of Kingston, which is the markets. Uh, next, please. 
And so you can see even from the early moments of um, thinking about what is architecture and its relationship to urbanism and the city, that I was thinking about ways in which what we do as architects or urbanists and planners somehow saturated into the context that there's no distinction between what we contribute and what the city actually is. So it was a real attempt in a thesis to figure out how do we have impact on the market or support the market through sets of infrastructures of water and shade, but really one that allows the market to flow naturally to saturate itself into the city naturally. Next, please. I'm also one of the co-founders of the Black Space Urbanist Collective. Um, and today is a unique day because we were originally founded at the first Black and Design Conference that Harvard held. And today is the Black and Design Conference um, is going on right now. And a lot of our colleagues are there. Uh, next, please. Um, and so Black Space demands a present and a future where Black people, Black spaces, and Black culture matter and thrive. About three years into our sort of planning and existing as a, a, a unit, we created what we refer to as a Black Space Manifesto. And there are a set of principles and ideas that we wanted to be present in the world with and that we wanted to um, show up as this is what we're about, this is how we want to practice, this is how we want to be seen in the world. Next, please. So one of our, I'm not sure all the principles, but one of our principles manifests the future um, is salient to a lot of how um, we go about thinking and working. Next, please. So um, the Cornell Mellon Design Workshop was a collaboration between Work Urban and Black Space and centered one of our community partners. The Brownsville Heritage House is a hundred year archive of the lives of Black people in Brownsville, Brooklyn, and it's a 40-year-old space at the Stone Avenue Library. The Stone Avenue Library is one of um, 20 libraries gifted to the city by Andrew Carnegie, and this, this room of the Stone Avenue Library was previously the children's reading room, and it was the first children's reading room in America. It's the, the space itself is not landmark, but for the last 40 years, it has been preserved by the Black community in Brownsville. Um, we worked with the executive director, Ms. Miriam Robertson, to think of a way to create a design strategy for how the future of this space um, could be considered and developed for the community. It was founded originally by a woman named Rosetta Gaston, who wanted to create a space for the children. And the mission has sort of continued and thrived, and the collection has grown over the years. Next, please. So what we were able to do, and we started working with um, Brownsville Heritage House um, as a community practice about five years ago. And we, and we arrived at the point where we thought about, could we do a design strategy for the Heritage House, but really work with young people who were local to Brooklyn and local to the community? So we partnered with Medgar Evers College Preparatory School, which is a high school um, in, in Brooklyn. Um, one of the partners of the Brownsville Heritage House was previously a, a speech and drama teacher at that high school. So there was a relationality um, to the high school. Also, I'm a Jamaican and the principal is also Jamaican. And so that whole connection came about by sort of building a relationship with the DOE. And so when we had this idea, the DOE put us together. So I didn't go pick a school that was the DOE. So like, you're Jamaican, the principal is Jamaican. Uh, you're from Cornell, the principal has students at Cornell. And so it was that kind of like allowing sort of relationships to build and mature. And so what the students did over the period of two summers ago was meet with the director of the center, Miss Mariam, to gain a sense of what the collection was about, to gain a sense of what um, the um, mission of um, the Heritage House is about. They also were looking at the history of Brooklyn, and for that, we traveled to um, the Brooklyn Historical Society, and here you see one of our students, one of our high school students, both looking at maps of the um, local maps of the neighborhood, but also getting a sense of the Black history of, um, of, of Brooklyn. Um, and here is one of the students who was really fascinated when he saw the historical documents for Weeksville, or the, the, the original tax records, where you see the actual signature of John Weeks. So what is it for a local youth to begin to sort of have an understanding that Black people own property in this neighborhood um, a, a very long time ago, to really think about what their lives in the neighborhood is, is today. The students also came with us um, to Cornell to present their findings in a lecture um, for a course I was teaching that semester. Uh, next slide, please. And so, from the exercises of the summer came the, came a design strategy report that um, Black Space is now working with the Heritage House and other partners to develop. Next slide, please. 
so it was the testament from Jordan Patterson, who is the executive director of My Brother's Keepers Alliance. And so the students that we worked with, as well as being students at Medgar and local to Brooklyn, are a part of an organization called My Brother's Keepers Alliance, which is a part of the Obama Foundation. And the organization's mission is to create a safe and supportive space for Black boys. Now, also, it's called MBK MSK. So it's a a safe and supportive space for um, Black boys and girls of color, such that, they, such that they feel valued and have a real sense of what their role could be in, in their communities and really look to community partners for support and also getting support to be in sort of unique environments where they get to thrive. And so because they had spent the summer working on this project, what I thought would be a half hour presentation to this two hour course of graduate students turned out to be the students really taking over the course for the entire two hours. And again, because they were talking about something that they were experts in and that they had spent the time and done support locally to be experts in. Also, it's important to note that their coming to Ithaca was 100% sponsored by their school. Um, so their school paid for them to come to Ithaca. And that's, that kind of relationship is important to me because as I shared with you the slide from Tops, when I had my first internship, what was important that I left out was that my high school paid my salary. And so think about what it means when you go into a space and you're not maybe sure about what your expertise or value is, but to know that um, your own community or the spaces that you come from is providing the resources for you to be there. And so key to the work that I do is really finding ways to have both institutional partners, but to find ways in which local and homegrown partners can have sort of equity and power in this sort of transaction. Next, please. Choose critical connection between critical mass. Next, please. And so I, I want to share a quote with you from um, Dr. Sharon Sutton's latest book, Pedagogy of a Beloved Commons, because so much of it resonates with my work. Um, I set out to explore an aspirational framework that would help young Peter, people. You're not oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. I set out to create, I set out to explore an aspirational framework that would help young people take hands-on action within the commons of low-income neighborhoods where they witness daily symbolic reminders of their abandonment and marginal status. I began by proposing that the emotional, physical, and intellectual realms of place-based critical pedagogy could help them ameliorate disinvestment in community infrastructure and amplify their political voice. And so much of my work is sort of inspired by um, Dr. Sutton's practice um, and, and me methodologies. Uh, next, please. So last year, we were invited to design the new reception desk for Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, it was after a series of work that Black Space had done, and then um, Ray Coddington asked me to work on this. I said, well, I'll work on it if we are able to do the work with students, and he was very open to that. So again, we turned to Medgar Evers because, again, they're local to the neighborhood, and we had a relationship in working with them. Uh, next, please. And so students met with Dr. Sutton at the Center for Architecture. At the time, there was an exhibition on her work, life, and methodology. And the exhibition that she was a part of was one that looked and traced her life in Ohio. So the exhibition talked about her journey moving through a segregated town or city in Ohio to go to her music class. And that was revelatory to me because along with being sort of a scholar in architecture, Dr. Sutton is also um, an accomplished um, musician. She plays the French horn, I believe. And at one point I know she played um, on Broadway um, for Man of La Mancha. So to hear her talk about her journey in terms of walking in Ohio through segregated um, neighborhoods to get to her music class really put a huge perspective on, on thinking about her life and how that life has influenced how she practices. Um, and so it was really important that we were welcome to the space of the center for her to share this work with our high school students who move to the project. Next, please. Students also work with one of our community partners to think about ways of building and making. So that suddenly when, before we even talk about making a desk, they had experience and knowledge with the craft of making. Next, please. We also held workshops at Weeksville where students worked alongside community members and staff and the director of Weeksville, again, utilizing our Black Space Manifesto principles to really find ways to amplify and think about the desk as being really meaningful to the community. Next, please. We also had sessions at their high school where colleagues from Cornell joined me to, in lectures. One of our colleagues, um, Dr. Rishay Richardson, is a scholarship in the sort of Black Southern Feminist Studies and, and, and Black Cultural Studies. And so she really came in as a support for us in terms of thinking about how this desk can have a sort of a deeper and broader conversation. So we really tried to cover all aspects of engagement when we think about the desk. The desk is now in 
knock on wood, hopefully fabrication very soon. Uh, next, please. Fine with design wood, next, please. So sort of another sort of individual who's salient to the work that I do, especially in the design studios, Darren Walker, and his recent book, From Generosity to Justice, it's, it's important to add that Darren Walker is a Black queer man who has transformed the face of philanthropy. It's kind of a quiet revolution that you start at the very grassroots level, you're starting to see take hold. Next, please. All these ideas about how do you work at the grassroots? How do you ensure that um, you're involving people at the beginning of processes and that you're understanding um, their value as participants and you're centering um, them in the process. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing in the design studio amplifies that or really tries to take that to heart. And so here you see a couple of our students here at Cornell working with the Brownsville community on sets of ideas revolving around public housing in Brownsville, Brooklyn, but really um, at every juncture, sort of listening to and being challenged by the community voice and recognizing that once you start talking to other people and having other people be a part of the process, your ideas change and your attitudes towards what design is and could be changes. I love working in Brownsville because there are over 70 examples of public housing in Brownsville. And so the challenge as an architect is, do you think version 71 will resolve any of the issues in the community? What happens when you talk to people in the community, different sets of solutions start to emerge or different sets of attitudes about what a process could be emerges. Next, please. Um, we've also worked, um, we do a lot of work with community partners and community gardens. And so um, there's volunteerism in the studio. Um, and one of the opportunities we get from volunteering is you get to sort of understand who the players are and somehow you, you, you cease to see people um, as you encounter them. So we spent two days working in the community garden of this woman, she's 80, um, her name is Miss Joanna Williams. And okay, at the outset, she seems like, oh, this charming old lady, we're gonna help her in her garden. But it turns out that this woman is a founder of the East New York urban garden movement. And she was a pioneer in really shaping what urban gardening is. And she's an immigrant. Um, I'm sorry, she's a US born, but her families are, are, are immigrants from the Caribbean. And a lot of the principles that she uses in the garden come from these practices that she inherited. We also found out that in 1975, when this movement began, she did this movement with Cornell, um, the first agent that Cornell Extension sent to East New York, Brooklyn, John Amarosa worked closely with her. In this, in meeting with John, who's also in his 80s, he really sort of validated everything that she had said and also let us know that a lot of the work that she did, she was sidelined for. And so what is it to be a Black woman? What is it to be someone who's local and working literally on the ground? That as a movement evolves, your presence in the movement has sort of not been amplified. So a lot of the work that we do in the studio, both in my practice and in Black space, is to amplify the work of individuals. And a lot of times we use the word community to stand in for individuals. And that's the way of robbing people of their identity and and the, the sort of things that make them uniquely who they are and inform their practices. Next, please. And so in the design studio, we usually, um, this is work that we're doing with a community partner, um, University in East New York, Brooklyn, and they're an ecological food laboratory in Brooklyn. And we've been working with them for three years now. The first year of the studio was really exploratory. This is um, the second year of the studio engagement. But what came out of the first year of the studio was really finding out, well, how can we support this really grassroots organization, very local and very to the ground? We spent time after the studio ended and supported the organization and getting a Mellon grant, which was sort of the first sort of large scale grant that enabled us to do more sort of deep and and continued work. It also gave us opportunity to think about how the university can be a partner. And so now our college through the Newey Host Center is involved in the preliminary stages of an, M of an MSF grant, um, which just kicked off this year, which really, again, links this community partner to sort of other um, environmentally conscious community partners local to Brooklyn. So you see that the work of the studio really depends on the resources of the studio, which is minimal, which is a good thing. It depends on the ingenuity of the studio students to sort of partner with a local community and come up with solutions that are local and familiar and in a way also new. It brings the techniques and the practices of how we think and work in the studio to a local community partner, but also relies on their ingenuity a lot. Next, please. So you'll see some of the ways that we practice and work in, with a community partner. Uh, next, please. Uh, create circles, not lines. Next, please. 
Um, lastly, uh, my lab at Cornell, um, the Cultural Responsive Learning Lab, really takes all of this and synthesizes it. How do we work with local youth and community partners to find ways to have um, creative and, and, and useful solutions to community issues? And this was born out of our studio last semester. Next, please. Um, one of the issues in East New York, along with food insecurity, um, it's an industrial, it's a historical industrial neighborhood. And so there is huge issues with ground pollution, huge issues with water runoff, but also huge issues with light pollution. So one of the things that um, when you spend time, you say, oh, why is the light so bright here? So next, please. So we worked with a local high school, Transit Tech, and again, it's all relational. The principal of Transit Tech was actually raised at the Brownsville Heritage House. He's one of the youth that were raised in that room, a space for the children. So, and, and again, that came from having a relationship with the DOE, having the DOE know what I'm doing, what we're doing, so that they are the ones to build these partnerships with us, so that we're transparent with who we know and how we know them. And we get, the, I think, the most salient connections from that. So we had our students at Cornell work with a teacher, Ms. Lorna Hurston. She's a science teacher at Transit Tech High School to really think about ways in which they could incorporate what they were doing in the studio with the high, with her curriculum at the high school. One of the things we learned really early on work with the high school was we got this sort of advice or threat from the um, Dr. Lester Young, who is the head of the New York State Board of Regents, don't give my kids any extra work to do, no ninth period. And so what that means is we have to find ways to work with the teachers in terms of what they're doing in the classroom and how the work of the design studio can impact and be a benefit to them, as well as be a benefit to the community as well. Next, please. So what they came up with was the schools were looking at biosoils, and so that's a great opportunity to look at sites in the neighborhood. Also, the idea of sites in the neighborhood, what's available, this term vacant lot is really problematic because it, it says that you are detached from your neighborhood. You can't, but there's some places you can't touch or go to, but they're quote unquote available. When there's very little reality in terms of vacant lot, we were able to work in a site that was owned by the family of one of our community partners, a family that had been there for 90 years. So they had steady in, in, in the community. Um, and we were able to sort of think of ways of building and creatively in the neighborhood, sort of these um, illuminated biosoils. Next, please. And of course, because of the light pollution, although we were able to work with the students to create the space, ultimately it didn't work as an experiment because of the light pollution. But we had um, the warehouse to go back to, to, which is local to the community, to sort of run the experiment. Next, please. Okay. And I'm going to share with you just a small snippet of a um, it's a two minute clip of how our studio works. Is that play? Oops, sorry. So this was last semester on mid review where we worked to transform the space of Tata, which is our um, other studio space here in New York City. And Bob was a huge part in helping us have access to that space. And we were able to have over 70 members of the East New York community come and share the day with us. What's representation? What does analysis look like when your audience is not, you know, the just us as architects and planners? How do we communicate to a broader public? How do we create spaces that that broader public is welcomed in and, and can see themselves in, but also uh, see something new? I think that we have this really awesome ability as architects and thinkers and planners um, to really sort of transform um, what people expect from us as architects and planners and to really transform um, what the solutions could possibly be. A lot of what you seek here is what university also brought into the space. So every, not everything is what we produce, but it was a co-production of really transforming the space. And so our community partner, um, you know, in very elaborate ways, we found ways to have them have unfettered access to Tata, which is a very unique <laughs> thing to have been able to do. <laughs> like to talk about just the access alone is a, is a whole subject.
Uh, I'm going to stand so you all can see me. Thank you. Well, I hope everyone's having a good morning so far. Uh, my name is Brandon Wang. I'm an associate at Datner Architects. Been there for the past seven years, and I'll talk a little bit more about my work there. Um, I just want to say I think it's been a great exchange of ideas, um, and I see. You know, I'm inspired by the commonalities that um, Violet and Peter have shared throughout their presentations, and uh, I'm excited to share this space with them and with you. I titled this um, Balancing Many Different Things because I think that um, summarizes both how I've grown up, um, how I uh, sort of carry myself through identity and through practice, and how I aspire to um, achieve different things and be exposed to different experiences to better grow as a, as a person, as an architect, as a designer, um, etc. So uh, next slide, please. This is a glimpse into my, my personal childhood and also where I am now. Uh, I was born in Detroit, grew up in Ontario. Uh, and then later on, in, mostly in Vancouver, as uh, throughout high school, came to Providence to, uh, to, for school at RISD and have ever since come to New York. And these different snippets um, that I've taken throughout the years to encapsulate these spaces um, all carry a different narrative for me and things that um, I try to hold on to and carry through in different ways throughout my life. Um, in Vancouver, adjacency to nature, clean cities, public health, um, and native history as well. Specifically for Providence, going there for school, being exposed and entrenched in architecture school, um, and being involved extracurricularly as well um, in various ways and being exposed to different art and design disciplines. And then Obviously, coming here to New York, many of maybe many of you call this home. Um, I this is a global hub. Um, I'm inspired by its infrastructure and the need to improve its infrastructure, uh, as well as the diverse cultures that I've been uh, lucky to experience since living here. Next slide, please. And so I uh, I see a lot of similarities with how uh, specifically how Peter mentioned. Uh, the evolution of identity and the, the growth from culture and how that informs your, your own personal identity and vice versa as to how your own values and uh, what you hold dear can be output to inspire others uh, that you are surrounded with um, to learn and to grow from and, and, and really be inspired by. So uh, parts of those include diversity, equity, good health, um, and, and good urban living. And I, it, I tried to summarize it really in a word with pluralism, um, the art uh, of holding many different things at once and ho holding the space for things to coexist uh, and flourish. Um, and as you, and then the, the theme of very real and not so real, I think, has been one that I've been carrying throughout many years is as architects, um, as Violet mentioned, uh, the real buildings and the real stuff that make up our cities, but also the not so tangible things, but still just as real, uh, whether it's cultural relations, family history, um, and other, other intrinsic values that can help also shape uh, how we live and who we are. Next slide. Growing up, I had, uh, like many or most of you, uh, various mentors over the years. And the beauty of that is identifying who can be your mentor and the, ver the different uh, questions that they can ask you 
to prompt different um, to prompt different ways of thinking or be exposed to different things. Um, I specifically called out three here, one of the first of whom I don't actually have a good photo of. Um, he was my old soccer coach, Rich Anderson. Um, I think what I really learned from him was was leadership and and taking ownership and being responsible for others. Um, the middle, my high school art teacher, Sam LeBlanc, she was the one who really inspired me to pursue my passion for arts and architecture and really was the one who said, you should apply to RISD. Uh, you should look outside your bounds and um, explore. And my thesis teacher at school, Jason Wood, um, from him, I developed my love of film, of movies, good storytelling, um, and also to see things, uh, how various scales can really mean the same thing. Um, and I think those, those three sort of phrases of mentorship, um, personal guidance and space making have been true through all of those relationships. And maybe you all can reflect on who those people are in your lives. Um, and how you can inspire others who come after you to, to just as much hold space. Uh, next slide. So I guess growing up, I didn't really have a sense of that word, uh, pluralism, but throughout school, um, my time, my five years, I was exposed to, or at least willingly put myself to um, experience a wide variety of things I tried I was invested as much in architecture as it was outside of architecture. And so these are snippets of different classes and disciplines that I was exposed to that I might not ever really get a chance to do now. Um, and I think it, I can attest to the, um, the personal growth that uh, I have, I've had um, after having been exposed to discussing um, these different uh, disciplines, different ways of thinking and making um, can be. So uh, next slide. These are some examples of some of my school work um, during my bachelor's degree. Um, I think the, the variety of intensive studios, um, architecture studios, in collaboration with other students um, has really uh, allowed me to ex you know learn how to work with others and hold space for others to make decisions or um, you know take take leadership in various ways um, I think but also more generally I wanted to I wanted to use this slide to really talk about the the culture of of overwork at architecture school and you are all probably in the midst of it, or hopefully maybe nearing the end of it, um, this culture of studio culture of hustle and work um, and deep investment. And I think that there, um, you may all find that relatable in some degree. Um, I myself really threw myself into the deep end coming into school. Um, I tried to challenge myself as much as I could. Um, I spent many late nights um, working on projects, um, making models, drawings. And I think, you know, I, I think over time, you know, I, at the time I didn't really question it. It was part of, it was just part of the zeitgeist really of, of, of school. Um, and I think, you know, being now seven years out, uh, eight years out, uh, I've really begun to unpeel and layer back and, and try and understand why that was considered normal um, and question as to how sustainable that really is and what um, what are healthier, better ways to achieve what you want to achieve, um, but still hold space for your own personal relationships, your own um, hobbies, interests as well, other dimensions of your identity. Um, next slide, please. But you know, uh, some good work came of 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 that deep investment. Um, I'm proud of this particular project. This was done at a summer between my junior and um, senior year. This was a collaborative design build um, project over six weeks, where we ideated, 
uh, collaborated with the local community in Rhode Island, um, in a suburb north of Providence, to take uh, this lot and transform it into uh, what we hope and uh, saw as a um, good space for, for public use. It's a, basically a public plaza that connects one side to the other and provided some shelter as well, um, this, this, this pavilion. Um, this, we hosted 20 some students from a university, an architecture university in Bogota, Colombia. And this neighborhood, Central Falls in Rhode Island, really being a um, Colombian heavy community, um, we were able to foster those relationships and get to know the local businesses from whom we bought lunch um, and really hopefully see this as a sustainable uh, solution to uh, public good public space making. Next slide. Since graduating from school, um, I came to Denton Architects and in the summer of 2016, I came right out of school um, as an entry level designer. My first, my first uh, role really was setting up and taking down conference rooms for other meetings. Um, among jumping among a myriad of other tasks. Um, and I really just tried to take that opportunity to uh, embed myself in what a, what an architecture office practicing in New York City um, can do. It, Datnar has been around in New York City since 1964, um, with the majority of the portfolio being civic and public projects um, serving the five boroughs here. The bread and butter of our work is uh, affordable housing and uh, a lot of mixed rate or um, affordable housing, um, specifically in Brooklyn and the Bronx, um, among other public uh, public clients or public agencies, um, including schools, uh, subway stations, um, any piece you may have interacted with uh, a data project if you've been here long enough. Um, I also put up um, various milestones that I consider important to myself and my, my personal growth. I tried taking my first exam a couple months after graduation and I failed miserably and, you know, really failed my first three uh, in a row and then decided to <laughs> say, okay, I'm gonna take a break. Let's maybe, uh, you know, revisit and, and sort of take stock of, of what I really wanna do. Um, I think part of that uh, culture that I was holding on to from school, the, the work, the studio embedment carried through into my rush to, you know, keep going with these exams and keep going with um, advancement. And I think it, it took a, a very quickly learn to sort of hold space for myself as well and, and take things at a certain pace that feels sustainable. Um, I did achieve actually my New York State license um, in 2019, a week before my 26th birthday. So I was very proud. Of I was proud of that moment, I think. But it also after uh, a big milestone or a big deliverable, you sort of sit back and say, "Okay, what's what's next?" or uh, you know, I was so busy doing all this work. What do I do? Like, how do I, like, my muscles are, are still fresh from, you know, doing all this work. What can I, how can I apply it next? Um, so I think being able to sort of take, take some space as well for yourself, um, and rest and finding, finding rest is, is important. And then throughout the last couple of years, I've been lucky to you know, engage myself as well within the office. We have about 115 people um, in various extracurricular ways, but mostly uh, what I find most rewarding is um, holding space for newer staff or junior staff to ask questions that are important to them, develop their careers, and um, pursue different interests that they may have besides a traditional design bid construction project. So studio resource leader or our sustainable practice group, these are various roles that I've played to 
help facilitate um, sustainable focused research for students who want to, uh, you know, dive into that or find resources on technical things that they might uh, may have questions about. Next, please. These are some examples of projects that I've worked on over the years. Um, first, th first top two, if you've ever been to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, you may know that there is a large complex um, capstone by Wegmans. But the building that you're seeing on the top is um, a public a parking garage and five stories of office space and in light industrial use for tenants of the Brooklyn Navy Yard to really uh, foster small business and local making uh, within the overall complex and serve as, uh, you know, serve the larger campus um, of the Navy Yard as well. The middle two images um, are a, a minor uh, interior renovation of a historic courthouse actually just across the street from us here, the U.S. Custom, um, uh, it's the, uh, it's, uh, the Southern District of New York Bankruptcy Courts. Um, we were lucky to, I was lucky to work on the um, MEP upgrades for this, for these spaces, these three different floors of courtrooms um, and various offices to, and um, I think this ties into what Violet's uh, quote or uh, discussion about um, life of uh, building life extending well beyond what you might imagine it to be and restoring and seeing new and improved use uh, and then the, the bottom two images are an ideas competition um, for uh, what we are called plasma gasification it's an idea to uh, radically uh, rethink how to deal with new york city's land uh, growing landfills and um, increased uh, waste, uh, waste streams. Next slide, please. Uh, and I feel like this is, and I, I really wanna focus the rest of my time here with on, on a project that I have been on since the inception of design and I think has, is most vulnerable for me to, to talk about because I haven't really talked about it publicly. And I, I know that it, it um, it can be uh, polarizing or divisive, um, or it can split people into uh, into different uh, camps. This is a project that I started on with our team, with my team in 2017. It is a new police precinct in Queens, in Rosedale, Queens, on the border with Bong Island. It started really as a um, started on the on the on the heels of 40 years of community led advocacy for uh, more local police presence at the time uh, a largely black community was uh, largely underserved uh, with 911 and distress calls and through local leaders kept pushing um, new york city mayors over the years to to uh, basically better serve this 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 place um, and that's that's a thread that I I'm underlining because that's something that I've hold held onto throughout the the tumult of um, of this project um, it was a two-year design process and by the end of 2019 we were we wrapped up the design as you can see uh, and we're ready to bid this was uh, this is funded by the New York City uh, Design Department of Design and Construction, um, the client agency being the police department. Um, next slide, please. You can get a sense of the scale. It's a two-story building um, adjacent an existing annex building because the, the district was so large they needed to put another satellite office to, to serve more local presence. Um, it sits right next to the Long Island Railroad, uh, the Rosedale Station. I use that to commute to the site um, every time I go out there. And so being able to see it from a, a, a local's perspective has always been um, deeply appreciated. Next slide, please. 
And there you can get a, a better sense of the site plan, um, how it situates on the site and the opening up um, and the creation of a public plaza in the middle to um, you know, allow for um, allow for, for good occupancy, good 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 place um, occupancy. Next slide. And I'm sharing these images because to to just scratch the tip of the iceberg that um, that this project can sit on, both in terms of social justice and politics. Um, in, as I said, in 2019, it was ready to go when COVID hit uh, in 2020. And then shortly after with uh, the murder of George Floyd and various Black Lives Matter and racial justice protests happening shortly thereafter that year, um, as you can see on the top right, um, there were a number of budget cuts um, that were, uh, of, of which this particular project was um, a part. And so with a lot more questions of um, many more urgent questions of what is what is the role of the police? Um, how does it serve or disserve local communities really came up, um, at least for myself internally and trying to understand and trying and struggling with this this question of work as my identity. But if um, but at the same time, this kind of work um, didn't sit well, or or felt like it uh, um, felt like it violated my innate, my my values. Um, a year later, in twenty twenty one, it was announced by De Blasio at the end of his term that he that this project, among others, was restarting. Um, and for me, at that point, that I feel like that was a pivot. It was like an inflection point. It was a pivotal moment in terms of what does this, you know, what does this moment mean? Do I, you know, I was really on the fence of, do I continue working on this? Um, because it's has so much, it is so politically charged. Um, but at the same time, I find it valuable to see, see a work through. Um, I was on it in the design since day one, but um, what would it mean to, to throw my hands up and say, I'm done with this? Um, or do I work through through these issues and these struggles um, and, and see it through construction? Next slide. This is an image um, of it in, in progress as of a couple months ago. Um, it has been seen through various city agencies and local politicians as uh, a priority and as an urgent addressing an urgent need for um, local community wants and desires. And every time there is um, basically a walkthrough meeting where local politicians come and um, as to, to celebrate its milestone, I'm always pleased to see that the original, uh, you know, one of the pioneers who advocated for this, um, Beth de Betham, uh, she's a local Rosedale advocate, has always remarked as I'm giving tours that she's appreciative of, of the work and finally that this work is being done um, and that their community needs are being realized. Um, and I think that's that's one of the threads that I'm holding on to in, in continuing this work. Yeah, next slide. That's <laughs> help of me as I'm on site all the time. Um, I think what's unique as well from a, from a, you know, sort of stepping back from a, from a traditional architecture practice, we don't often get to go on site and see progress um, day by day. This is a particular, particularly special case. And I feel lucky that I'm able to do that where I'm there three days a week and working with the contractor, working with the different trades to, you know, under, you know, have, have, understand what the project means and how to build literally bolt by bolt um, this, the, this, this, this overall building. And so I think various ways and seeing this progress has shown, or at least taught me many lessons that I hope you all will, will gain if you choose to pursue, um, you know, 
working in an architecture office, learning to speak different languages. Um, specifically, how do you communicate with a contractor? How do you convey your idea, not with jargon, but with uh, relational language? Um, how do you learn from your mistakes? I There were many times on here as things were going up, I realized the detail that I drew did not really work out and I would store it and say, okay, I can do this better for next time. I'm gonna move this piece of board over here. I'm gonna move this wall over here. Um, and so I think that kind of self-reflection and self critical self-reflection is is something that um, I've carried through, you know, from childhood to school and hope to continue to carry through as I progress um, through professional work and hope that others who come after me can learn some of the same lessons um, or learn their own lessons as to how to um, be a better architect day by day. Next slide. And so I'm, uh, you know, this sort of experience past school, um, working with, you know, in actual buildings and learning from real things, um, I began to have, I began to reframe or relook at old attitudes that I really felt like was the way to go from school. Um, and how can I reframe that to a healthier, more sustainable, uh, but also more dimensional part um, for myself now and in the future. So instead of embracing hustle culture or embracing the go now, it was due yesterday attitude, uh, I'm trying to take more time with things and be thorough. And if it takes an extra day to be sure, then take that time. Um, I think embedding myself and uh, you know doing things is, is always going to be a struggle because I always want to do more and I want to be involved, but I understand you know it's not always sustainable. And I think having having that realization um, and nimbleness is 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 key. Um, I've never really liked the phrase "fake it till you make it." Um, and I can't remember where, but I learned that, uh, learn it till you earn it is a, it's a better way to, to, to think about things. Um, and I think the most important part of my career, uh, that I've really taken is to always ask questions and never be afraid to learn. Um, but as I've grown through and through, I've, learn to you know be specific about that question and say you know what are um, ask both specific questions so you can get a specific answer but also ask open-ended questions so you can expand your ways of thought uh, and be more exposed to to new experiences and then yeah next slide i came across this this quote from uh, a youtuber that i really liked where he says, a meaningful opinion needs complexity, and complexity comes from experiencing things that are different from us. And so I guess I would leave with the question of where do you find differences from you, and how do you engage with it? Uh, and how do you open yourself up to, to newness and different things so you can grow your own career? And then I'll end on the last image, which is, if you've ever done an ikigai, um, if you haven't, it's it's basically a personal exercise to answer four different questions, which are, what do you love? What are you good at? What can you be paid for? And what the world needs? And to start from the outside and start, you know, just jotting things down. What do I love? Running, movies, cities, and then as you start to work in, you look for overlaps and you look for where, you know, where things can share. Um, and I haven't filled out the middle portion. I can't really answer yet what that one thing is that answers all four questions, but I think that's just a, a narrative for how I guess we're going through life and learning new things um, and being open. So, 
Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. And a corollary would be don't frame your questions the night before lectures before you've heard the presentations. Uh, I was sounding everyone out ahead of time. So it's said very kindly wait till you hear my lecture because you may have some of those answers, which is true. Um, I'm going to ask the panels to each think about a question that they have for each other. And I'm going to throw out a few quick questions, but since we only have about 30 minutes, I'd rather you all get a chance to ask questions. And even going to sound slightly simplistic, but there are things I'm curious about. Before I launch into that, you will have received your assignment, I think by now or any second. Um, we are gonna try to print out um, office names and have them around ringing the room so that people wanna go together, they can go meet under the name of the office. There are league volunteers um, and staff members who are going to some of these offices. In fact, Jacob, our executive director is going to SOM. Billy, our operations director is going to Bernheimer. Um, both on sort of opposite sides of the island, um, well, one's on another borough. But um, anyway, if you want to go on your own, that's fine too. But it just if you would like to go over with a group, that's fine. Um, so, okay, the quick questions. First job in design. Um, and when? I, I did an internship at the age of 16 in Paris, the city where I grew up in France, um, for a small architecture firm. I called Baudin et Associé. Uh, also an internship, I came to New York between my sophomore and junior year, and it was at a five-person local real estate development office where I drew bathrooms. <laughs> Propellum Costo Architects in New York City um, at 560 Broadway. Um, I was a sophomore in high school. I was there for two years and the summer. My first job was um, 109 Prince Street, which is still around. Um, it was renovation when Soho was a real warehouse district. It was the, one of the first buildings that were sort of being transformed in the neighborhood. What didn't you take in school or do in school you wish you had a class or an experience? <laughs> we can start, but we can go the other way around. So um, in grad school, I had always thought I wanted to do the double major in real estate. I just didn't have the time. And um, looking back, I still think, wow, I think I would have really wanted that because so much of what I do and think about now is revolving, revolving into having to know more about that. Uh, the biggest regret I have from school is not studying abroad. So if you have done that or you want to, Go for it. Uh, I wish I had taken a film class. Okay. All of you are involved in teaching in different ways. Um, we've heard mentoring high school. Viola didn't talk about it quite as much, but she's teaching it at Yale and has taught some other places. What do you think that brings to your understanding and practice? And how do you see your role as a teacher? Um, it's so I, I was going to talk about it in, in the slides, but I, I sort of skipped over it, unfortunately. I think that one of the most magical things about being in school uh, is the theater of uh, the discipline that you get to witness. So every course, every like within the structure of a day, you will be exposed to so many different ideas of having being prompted to design something or discussing your design but also we're studying architecture that is centuries old or um, technologies that are just emerging now. And that's a fascinating place to be. Uh, and that to me inspires the balance that I try to seek out in the life I conduct today in architecture. Um, as far as teaching, it, to me, it's a real privilege to be back in that arena where everything is moving all the time and the discussion is really animated, but also you can be totally zoomed in to somebody's design of a, a building or zoomed out and discussing um, what happens in the lecture that a new uh, a character has given that evening or what your colleagues are teaching in a history class. So um, that's, that's the beauty of the teaching environment. 
Um, so I was really lucky. I think I had, I know I had really great and amazing teachers. And so um, throughout my career as a student, what I learned to appreciate was the sort of the language of architecture and the power of that language to sort of shape and mold and um, finding ways to share that language. And so in terms of how I teach now, it's very much reliant on um, the practice of teaching architecture the way I, I was taught it, and also the practice of supporting uh, my students and trusting my students. And I think the way that I teach, we work in community with community partners and it's never holding back, but it's always giving our students the ability to be fully present and to amplify their own agency, which is something that we often think of as the opposite of community engaged practice. We often think, oh no, we have to listen, we have to say, we heard and they said, and now we're doing it. That's not how I learned architecture. People think, oh, that's a bad way. I said, well, no, there was something really powerful to the way we were challenged in school and we were challenged to think in school and, and we were always held to the rigor of the discipline. And that, that stays in terms of how I teach, but what also I think it gives our students when we're working in communities that are very unlike communities that they come from, it gives them a kind of an assurity that they have something to offer. Um, and for the first time, I think they begin to recognize that they do have a voice. And I think when you go into practice, and I think it works so inspiring, like when you go into practice, the rigors of practice is the reality. Um, and you'll find ways to amplify your own voice in practice. But I think you learn that practice in school um, by being present. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think it's the the value that you gain uh, really comes from the investment that you want to put in. And I, while I'm not in a formal teaching uh, setting, I have been lucky to call a few of my colleagues uh, my mentees, and I've been lucky to call a few of my colleagues as my mentors as well. And I think the biggest value or biggest lesson that I've learned through these interactions is learning to uh, ask open questions for for others to find their own path and find their own their own ways. I think it's I've learned that it's less about answering or solving their 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 problems and it's more of uh, prompting them to think about different things or experience something from a different point of view so they can, on their own or through their own means, uh, discover uh, what it is that they're looking for. My last quick question. Each of you, in, in different ways, but does work in community, uh, both community outreach, community access, and community dialogue. <laughs> Is that something you learn in school? Is that something you pursue when you're first out? In short, because it's a, obviously a very complicated topic, but how do you do that and what's the impetus to the one project as an example? In, in school or? No, now. And now. did you learn any of that in school or how did you learn it along the way? We've got a whole bunch of people here who are about to start practice. And increasingly, not only is practice collaborative, I come from a generation where things were not collaborative, you were proving yourself. And I think that curricularly looking at the way schools operate, but certainly when you come out, there's so much more collaborative work, um, but also work in community where you're not coming in as the architect creator, but you're coming in as a parallel member of the community to listen and then to learn from that and then either create a project or make something new happen or create an educational experience how and where did you gain that skill? I think you learn it in life. Um, one of the things that I discovered in teaching theories of urban form is when you ask students to look at their own lives and how they were raised and um, who influenced them, that practice of community engagement, you'll discover that you have been taught that in your life and in your own communities, in your own families, and in your own sort of social infrastructures. And if I'm honest, that's how I learned it. There wasn't a course called community engagement at Cornell when I graduated at there. Because no. I do it. <laughs> but but so what we have to draw on is that life is, is a life practice. And I think when students encounter it that way, that they recognize their own agency in the practice. And I hope that's something they carry forward when they 
move into practice that um, it's some, I mean, when you go into practice, there's a lot of new opportunities that are available to you. And I was lucky that I started out in New York at a time when a lot was happening in the city. Um, New York Coalition of Black Architects had just been sort of relaunched and revamped. I was able to be a part of that. And I think if it's a course you took in school, then you take the course, you get the credit and you move on. But if you're able to interrogate your own life and the value of being present in your own life and, and being active in communities, I think then that becomes a practice. So I don't, I, I, I don't, I'm not convinced that there's a course that could prepare you for that. Although I think it's important to have that structured in the sort of curricular and pedagogical um, agendas moving forward in architecture and urban design and urban planning. But I think um, it's a life practice. I think I was maybe first exposed to that through various courses. Um, the idea of, of working in a community and working with um, place-based work and really, I guess, having uh, being lucky and finding the right professors who had that same um, institutional knowledge, but also the connections to make this kind of project happen. Um, that's and, and and I guess my the second part of my answer is to really use your friendships that you gained over time and as people grow and diverge into various paths to uh, make, you know, keep them, hold them dear and find ways to meaningfully engage them because they may, they will be part of different communities that you may not be fully aware of, but, um, you know, Staying connected with your friends, your 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 colleagues um, throughout life. Yeah, I, so I think it's interesting, and um, that your prompt is uh, circles around collaboration, which I think is just like absolutely fundamental to anybody's architectural trajectory. Like I said, like we we all learn so much in practice because. Um, because more senior architects have built buildings and they are there to impart that knowledge into into the younger generations and that's what that mentorship is really instrumental for um but while that sort of provides a, a, a food chain um there's also this idea that and you also brought this up Brandon, that we speak multiple languages so you have to go on site and be very clear about I'm talking about this pile and, and the six inches between this pile and this other thing. And not it's not four inches, it's six inches. But uh, it's, that's a really technical conversation. And sometimes we're talking about the loftier goals of architecture. And But I think one of the aspects that was definitely not taught in school is uh, people live in architecture. And uh, you're often going to be courting a client and that client may or may not live in the end result of the architecture you're producing. Um, but in the end, the person who lives in the architecture has a lot to say about it. And that's really interesting. So, and that takes being quiet sometimes and really like making space for others to, to voice um, their experiences. And I, I think you spoke about it beautifully, but you have to be, uh, you have to meet around the table and not be at the lectern. You know, it's about uh, where are we with this? What, what do I not know? As opposed to like, look at my cool drawings, which is what you learn in school, which is really fun and exciting and exhilarating. And I love it as much as you do, but um, there's a space for humility in architecture that I think needs to be drummed up. I think it's also really important to let people know what you're interested in, especially when you move into practice. Um, I worked in you know small firms, also corporate offices. And I think one of the things that always amazes me is people recognize that the whole person is promoting. Um, and what does that mean? It means if the people that you work with don't know the things you're interested in, they don't know where you would be willing to put an investment in terms of the culture and the practice of the firm. I remember very early on in my career at Gensler because people knew I was interested in youth and teaching and a partner put that together. It was like Walter Hunt who said, hey, do you want to do learning by design at the Center for Architecture? And there wasn't even a building yet. And that's why it always throw, throws me off when I think about celebrating an anniversary. But I said, but that happened before that. But that was because people knew what I was interested in. Um, 
people from Cornell knew I was interested in it and they would tell other people. And so this offer didn't come because I applied for a position or I raised my hand. Someone came up to me and said, hey, you're interested in this thing. Can you do it? And then that gives you a different perspective in terms of how whatever office you're practicing and practices, it gives you a broader understanding of what makes up that sort of culture for me working in. And I think that is how you advance your career. Okay. Your turn. Questions? And the microphone will be, and then next in back. First off, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. So all of you uh, spoke about the importance of history, teaching history, being taught, and also some of you had uh, experiences with historical preservation projects and, you know, like reuse, uh, something like that. So my first question is that uh, there's always this idea of architecture being an experience shaped by time. So uh, how can we adapt to the evolving uh, cultural and technological trends while uh, still preserving the historic and artistic significance of a certain you know, place. And the, the question is like, how do you, how do we uh, strike a balance between tradition and innovation? That's my first question. And my second question is, uh, you all also spoke on like the importance of uh, personal experience uh, relationships and community involvement. So, um, I mean, how can we achieve, how can architecture achieve an experiential and metaphysical connection with the surroundings and, uh, you know, while still fulfilling its primary uh, functions as a space? So, let me get questions. Thank you. If it's okay, I don't think I'll answer because I don't think that we necessarily could resolve this idea of how much preservation, how much innovation can be balanced in a, in, in a project. And I think that will differ widely uh, according to the project and the context and the asks. But I do think that every project handling existing structures involves the maintenance of that structure and the ad adaptation of that structure as well. Um, I haven't resolved this for myself and I think it's a lifetime's work. I think it will be really relevant in all of your careers because I hope we're going to start understanding that at least in this cultural context, older buildings get demolished all the time. Um, that's extremely wasteful. And today, I don't think we can justify that responsibly. So ideally, all of us get much more familiar with handling existing structures. And the question is, is the word preservation? Preservation carries with it the idea of um, sort of preciousness. All buildings are not equally precious. All buildings maybe should not be treated equally preciously. But there's, there's so much at stake there. It depends so much what that structure has represented um, to what community for how long, where is it now? And, and what's happening to the immediate environment? Like, is it flooding? So what do you do? Um, how are you going to power it if it becomes a school and it has um, eight hours of intensive use every day? There's just, every building is a different equation, I think. So that was for your question of tradition innovation, which I decided not to answer. Um, and then I think that for this idea of personal experience, community engagement, um, one of the points that I heard from both of my colleagues is it, it's important to acknowledge yourself and to seek out the balance that is the best adapted to, to you. So sort of what, what are you interested in? And um, I don't, in my life, I'll say this, um, there hasn't been, I, I can just plug into this organization and it will answer all of my wants. So, so you have to create that sort of mosaic of different 
responsibilities and activities. Should we do another question and have some? I think back there. That was, I think her hand was up back there first. Hi, uh, I'm Evelyn from City College. I, I wanted to ask to what extent do you feel a personal responsibility projects like that, police precinct or like community involved projects? To what extent do you have a personal connection with those projects? And to what extent do you think you should have a personal connection with those projects? Uh, that is a very good question, and I think one that I have tried to grapple with for a while. I think the the culture that I grew up with in school, in the and really from the culture of architecture, um, can be that you are your work, and I think when that comes to odds with your values and um, and say a particular project, it can I it can feel uh, like you're betraying yourself or you're <laughs> you're falling short of of something that you believe in. Um, I think how I've tried to to go about that now is to uh, really figure out what the crux of a project is and who it's serving and who's going to be using that. And if that if that is you know aligns with who you are and what you believe in, um, you know that can be your 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 through line, and that can be something that you hold on to 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 keep going. If if it if you feel like it comes too much at odds, then it's also okay to to you know say I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I. It, 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 I mean, it might not apply for everyone. Some people might be more strict about it. Um, so I think that it's like I, when I decided to continue working on that project, um, one friend said that they don't really want to talk to me anymore for that decision. So I think that that was a difference in how, like where, how much value we embed in our work. Uh, but it's also okay sometimes to, draw a line and say my work is my work and what I you know my values I still have those so it's I don't really have a good answer for that but it's something that I'm trying to come to terms with day by day we have time for a last one more audience question and then there's some time to mingle and people to come up if it's okay with all of you to ask everyone questions individually and that is probably more efficient too. So go with this one and then we'll do that. You've gotten your assignments. We'll get up the signs. Please take bagels. Um, <laughs> what's left they'll get have in the studios. You will get food at the last stop at Woods Baggett. It's not just a tour, it's a reception too. But there's also, I think some of your guys are well aware of the fact that you'll be looking for slice cards or something um, if you decide you need more to eat. Enough pragmatics, go, <laughs> sorry. Hi, my name is Kate. I'm an undergraduate architecture student at Barnard. I just wanted to thank you all so much for sharing such beautiful and critical frameworks for acting with intention and meaning and reflection. And I was wondering, thinking about the people and spaces that have mentored you, what questions did they use to challenge you that, would, that you would pose to us as well? Okay. Wonderful. I taught at Barnard when I was um, a grad student, so I really appreciated my time there. Incredibly, incredibly smart students. The smartest students I ever had were Barnard students. <laughs> um, and so I, I shared a quote by Dr. Sutton, and who's a, I teach community practice now, but the, when I started doing community engaged work in the studio, no one hired me to do it. I, I had started doing it because I was inspired by the way Dr. Sutton um, was writing and was teaching in, in Washington and other people who I saw use it as a subject but not center it. So the first time I did it was at um, Parsons. You know, they asked me to teach Urban Design Studio. I said, we're going to go in the community. And so I was lucky that Dr. Sutton had just started her tenure at Parsons as the distinguished faculty. 
So I remember being very excited to share with her my syllabus. I remember her very dutifully. She read it thoroughly and pulled it apart and challenged me in almost every single part of it. And right now, my colleague at Cornell, um, Susan Letary, is putting together a symposium, and Dr. Sutton is one of the speakers. And she's like, oh, Dr. Sutton asked me this. What do you think? I was like, no, she's challenging you. Be, you know, it's, she's challenging, and she's being very thorough, meaning she's read your stuff, and she's challenging you. And that was hugely supportive, inspiring, and gut-wrenching at the same time, because, but it took me maybe a year to realize, oh my goodness, she actually was paying attention to what I was thinking. And it wasn't so much that she was giving me advice based on what she did, but she was asking me to be aware that this thing that I'm engaging in is worthy, and I should be a lot more critical of it. The first studio I taught was called Take Care of Yourself. And it was really me having a conversation with myself and with my students about what it is to be present in the world, that how does it, how do you begin to think about being of use to anyone if you're not at first recognizing your own value and your own sort of infrastructure of care? Um, and then actually getting to know her work a lot better as I actually started to we read a lot of her writings and um, sort of pay more attention to her. That, that's what she was always talking about, this idea of because you are so central to the work, to this sort of community-engaged practice work, to be sort of fully invested first in what you have to offer and knowing that precisely is the most critical part. We're often taught that we should step back and listen. All those things are true, but whatever you do, it's going to be your product. And that was sort of a really sort of eye-opening and it really shifted how I thought about that as both practice and both the way to teach. Um, and then around the same time, we were thinking about Black Space Urbanist Collective together. So we were asking ourselves all these questions, you know, what does it mean? If we said unlearn, that means unlearn everything. That means unlearn everything we were thought we knew about what it meant to be present in communities and work with other people. And if you're going to strip everything away, the only thing you have left is yourself. And what does it mean to sort of build off of that? So I remember when um, so I'm on the board of the center and we had really worked hard to get Dr. Sutton's show in the show. It wasn't a, a, an easy, yeah, right. She's going to talk about herself and her life in Ohio and what does that have to do with architecture and practice. And I was like, well, no, that's central because we're going to bring a different, hopefully get a different audience into the center. And what does it mean for them to see someone in architecture do the thing that we typically don't do, talk about ourselves, which is really difficult because we're often to be objective now. Um, and so that was also hugely inspiring to be able to take young people into a space like the center and, and, and to see someone who looks like them center themselves and also recognize that there were challenges in that center and it didn't work out perfectly. Um, Dr. Sutton calls it uh, humiliating because a lot of what she tried to have inserted in terms of the project was not. So then it, it was almost extractive as a process, but students got to see that and got to understand fully what it, what it means to sort of be present and to insert yourself in your work and, and be vulnerable to the outcomes. Um, so that's a long, I guess, answer to your question, but. Yeah. So I think on that note, feel free to ask individual questions. Um, any last words, Bob, Jacob? So we'll enjoy your time here, enjoy your time at the offices and we'll see everyone together again at Woods Baggett um, in the end. Thank you.